the first question is, why do we need to even worry about um, a pandemic threat? What is it that we're concerned about? When I say we, I'm at the Council on Foreign Relations. We're concerned in the national security community and, of course, in the biology community and public health community. Well, globalization has increased travel. It's made it necessary that everybody be everywhere all the time, all over the world. And that means that your microbial hitchhikers are moving with you. So a plague outbreak in Surat, India, becomes not an obscure event, but a globalized event, a globalized concern. That it's changed the risk equation. And Katrina showed us that we cannot completely depend on government to have readiness in hand, to be capable of handling things. Indeed, an outbreak would be multiple Katrinas at once. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people suffer from communicable diseases, and many die unnecessarily from preventable infections. Communicable diseases recognize no boundaries, for they've taken their toll of human life the world over. Their control may be a national problem, or it may be regional, involving several states, or it may be local. An epidemic might start anywhere and reach into many states. The classic example is the 1918 influenza pandemic, which was first recognized in Boston and within a month spread throughout the entire country. Today, always watchful for epidemics, practicing physicians constitute the first line of defense. But the responsibility for the prevention of communicable diseases is vested primarily in the state and local health departments, which are assisted upon request by the United States Public Health Service. The Communicable Disease Center, with its headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia, serves the nation in field investigation, prevention, and control of communicable diseases. What do we know from 1918, the last great pandemic? The federal government abdicated most responsibility. And we ended up with this wild patchwork of regulations all over America. Every city, county, state did their own thing. And the rules uh, and the belief systems were wildly disparate. In some cases, all schools, all churches, all public venues were closed. The pandemic circulated three times in 18 months in the absence of commercial air travel. The second wave was the mutated super killer wave. And in the first wave, we had enough healthcare workers. But by the time the second wave hit, it took such a toll among the healthcare workers that we lost most of our doctors and nurses who were on the front lines. And overall, we lost 700,000 people. The virus was 100% lethal to pregnant women, and we don't actually know why. And most of the death toll was 15 to 40-year-olds, robustly healthy young adults. It was likened to the plague. We don't actually know how many people died. The lowball estimate is 35 million. This was based on European and North American data. A new study by Chris Murray at Harvard shows that if you look at the databases that were kept by the Brits in India, there was a 31-fold greater death rate among the Indians. So there's a strong belief that in places of poverty, the death toll was far higher, <laughs> and that a more likely toll is somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 100 million people before we had commercial air travel. In cooperation with local health agencies all over the country, the Communicable Disease Center, better known as CDC, has established diagnostic laboratories, applied research projects, control operations, and field training centers. CDC employs a variety of professional specialists skilled in every aspect of communicable diseases. Medical epidemiologists, veterinary epidemiologists, public health nurses, laboratory technicians, parasitologists, entomologists, sanitary engineers, statisticians, training specialists, and many others who work together to solve the practical problems and get results in the fight against communicable diseases. So what's concerning us? Well, first of all, at no time in history have we succeeded in making, in a timely fashion, specific vaccine for more than 260 million people. It's not going to do us very much good in a global pandemic. You've heard about the vaccine we're stockpiling, but nobody believes it'll actually be particularly effective if we have a real outbreak. So one thought is, 
After 9-11, when the airports closed, our flu season was delayed by two weeks. So the thought is, hey, maybe what we should do is just immediately, we hear there's H5N1 spreading from human to human. The virus is mutated to be a human to human transmitter. Let's shut down the airports. However, huge uh, supercomputer analyses done of the likely effectiveness of this show that it won't buy us much time at all. And of course, it'll be hugely disruptive in preparation plans. For example, all masks are made in China. How do you get them mobilized around the world if you've shut all the airports down? How do you get the vaccines moved around the world and the drugs moved and whatever may or may not be available that will work? So it turns out that shutting down the airports is counterproductive. A communicable disease is one which can be caught from someone else. This means that the germs have to leave the body of a sick person and enter the body of one who is well. Viruses. Viruses, and there are many different kinds of them, can be scattered with each particle of saliva and mucus. When one sneezes or coughs, for instance. But do not think for a moment that producing viruses are spread only by sneezing and coughing. If by some magic, the tiny particles of saliva and mucus could be made visible as a black smudge, we quickly would realize in how many other ways we are apt to scatter bacteria and viruses all around us. The usual gateway by which they enter is through the mouth or nose. For instance, Jane here has a cold. Look at that smudge. Look at those germs she leaves on the doorknob. And here's Bob's hand picking them up. Bob, his hand now covered with germs picked up from that doorknob, transfers them to a book. Sue, having the bad habit of wetting her finger to turn pages, carries the germs from the book to her mouth and then passes them along with a pencil to Anne. Anne carries them home and leaves them on the family's dinner table. Yes, even during an ordinary conversation, saliva and mucus particles escape our mouth and easily reach others who inhale them as they breathe. Just remember how breath becomes visible on a cold day. Coughs and sneezes which are not protected send germs in a direct spray. Kissing also gives germs a direct short trip. The public drinking cup is a favorite means of travel. As individuals and as a community, we can do many things to halt this movement of germs and prevent the spread of disease. And the bottom line, major thing that's come through in every single drill, nobody knows who's in charge. Nobody knows the chain of command. If it were Los Angeles, is it the mayor, the governor, the president of the United States, the head of Homeland Security? In fact, the federal government says it's a guy called the principal federal officer who happens to be with TSA. The government <laughs> says the federal responsibility will basically be about trying to keep the virus out, which we all know is impossible, and then to mitigate the impact primarily on our economy. The rest is up to your local community. Everything is about your town, where you live, well, how good a city council you have, how good a mayor you have. That's who's going to be in charge. Such an announcement is made in your city, don't give way to fear. Just remember that scientists would already be working to control the outbreak. Probably some of the people in your neighborhood would become sick. Reports of the disease would start pouring into health and medical authorities. The number and location of cases would be plotted on a map of the area. Scientists would go to work immediately to identify the cause of the disease. Meanwhile, the outbreak would take on a definite pattern. A healthful community must have a safe water supply. Here we see sedimentation and chlorination, a part of the process of water purification. We can do much to prevent the spread of disease by keeping away from those who are sick. Common sense tells us to stay away from indoor crowds whenever communicable diseases are prevalent. Certainly cleanliness should be observed in all places where food is sold or served. 
All dishes used by the public should be sterilized. The use of paper cups instead of common drinking glasses will help keep down the transmission of disease. Keep yourself and your family clean. Don't help germs by making things easy for them. Germs have trouble living in clean places. Our hands may pick up germs. The one act of washing the hands after going to the toilet and before eating. Wash all contaminated garments thoroughly to remove germs or toxins. Always report sickness promptly. Most local facilities would all be competing to try to get their hands on their piece of the federal stockpile of a drug called Tamiflu, which may or may not be helpful, I'll get into that, of available vaccines and any other treatments and masks and anything that's been stockpiled. And you'll have massive competition. If your doctor recommends sending a member of your family to the hospital, cooperate. Local health and medical authorities would distribute instructions so that the outbreak of the disease could be controlled. Follow their instructions closely. If you are called upon for a blood sample, don't hesitate to give it. Blood samples would be extremely important. Health and medical authorities would identify the cause of the disease as soon as possible. The recovery of those already sick would be speeded up with the use of modern drugs. Mass inoculations might be necessary to keep the disease from spreading. This would require the cooperation of everyone. So are we ready? As a nation, no, we're not. And I think even those in the leadership would say that is the case, that we still have a long ways to go. So what does that mean for you? We cannot keep all germs from entering our bodies. But wise old nature has placed within us natural forces capable of fighting the invading armies of disease. The better the condition of our health, the stronger this last line of defense against the invader. Well, the first thing is, I wouldn't start building up personal stockpiles of anything for yourself, your family, or your, or your employees, unless you've really done your homework. Uh, what mask works, what mask doesn't work. What, how many masks do you need? The Institute of Medicine study felt that you could not recycle masks. Well, if you think it's going to last 18 months, are you going to buy 18 months worth of masks for every single person in your family? Building up this resistance depends upon a well-balanced diet which satisfies all the food requirements of our body. Everybody has come up to me and said, well, I'll stockpile water, or I'll stockpile food, or what have you. Well, really? Do you really have a place to stockpile 18 months worth of food, 24 months worth of food? Do you want to view the pandemic threat the way back in the 1950s people viewed the civil defense issue and build your own little bomb shelter for pandemic flu? I don't think that's rational. I think it's about having to be prepared as communities, not as individuals, being prepared as nation, being prepared as state, being pre prepared as town. Outdoor exercise in the fresh air and sunshine. And right now, most of the preparedness is deeply flawed, and I hope I've convinced you of that, which means that the real job is to go out and say to your local leaders and your national leaders, why haven't you solved these problems? Why are you still thinking that um, the lessons of Katrina do not apply to flu and put the pressure where the pressure needs to be put. At least six glasses of water daily. But I guess the other thing to add is if you do have employees and you do have a company, I think you have certain responsibilities to demonstrate that you are thinking ahead for them and you are trying to plan. At a minimum, the uh, British banking plan showed that telecommuting can be helpful. It probably does reduce exposure because people are not coming into the office and coughing on each other or touching common objects and sharing things via their hands. Uh, but can you sustain your company that way? Well, if you have a dot com, maybe you can. Otherwise, you're in trouble. And plenty of rest. At least eight hours of sleep every night. 
Every step we take to prevent the spread of disease means increased happiness and greater living efficiency for all of us.